Hi, I'm Anna Funder. I'm a writer. One of the most exciting books published recently is a memoir by Beruz Buchani. No Friend But the Mountains is poetic and powerful. It was written under extraordinary circumstances on a mobile phone and smuggled out from behind bars in the form of thousands of text messages. The book went on to win the most lucrative prize in Australian publishing, the Victorian Prize for Literature, which is astonishing because Beirut's Buchani has never set foot in Australia. This is his story. <laughs> I was thinking about the first interactions in terms of how to help Beruz to get his voice out. Your body's been made invisible, your voice has been made inaudible. We're gonna make it as loud as possible. I was telling them that I'm gonna take your images to the public spaces, I'm gonna enlarge them, I'm gonna like put them in, in spaces where people can feel your presence. And like that journey up until here, who would have thought that this can be possible? Beruz Puchani has found a way of being in the world that is impassioned, aggrieved, angry, caring, and eloquent about his situation. Oh, I'm just sort of kind of overcome that he managed to produce such a work, which is fierce. To give him the prize, the richest literary prize in the country, that was a thunderclap. Winning the prize would be at once a great joy and the cruelest of torments because he's honoured by the country that keeps him imprisoned. I first met Behruz on Manus Island and that was after I had been translating his work for close to two years. By that time, I had translated 80% of Behruz's book, and I knew the importance of this work in Australian history, so I wanted to get everything right. Clear over the Markham Valley, but quite a bit of cloud build up on the mountains. So at that time, refugees were allowed out. Uh, obviously, nowhere to go, they couldn't leave the island. Behruz was already in town at that time, waiting for me to arrive. It was clear that he was stressed, but he was proud, he was dignified. He doesn't want to be seen as simply a weak individual in the detention centre. He doesn't want to be seen as a broken human being. When I arrived at Christmas Island six years ago, I told them that I am a writer. An immigration official just laughed at me and told me that they we're going to exile me to Manus Island, a place in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. There are two reasons why Beruz is extremely important to understanding what's happening in Manus Island. One, of course, it's getting that information out, being a reliable source. But the other reason is that he's presenting a person to the world that disrupts a lot of the narratives that people have about refugees. So it is only a part of the camp, the prison. Actually, most of it, they demolish it. He's not looking for people to save him. Essentially, he's telling people that I've empowered myself through the work that I'm doing. I was born in a small village west of Iran in Kurdistan, behind the mountains. And my father and my mother were farmers. Baruz Bachani grew up into war, born in the early 80s during the height of the Iranian and the Iraqi conflict. Iraq and Iran were fighting each other on Kurdistan land. 
For me and those people who experience war, is you know most uh, horrible thing. He emerged out of a struggling background, and yet he made it to university in Tehran. He studied political science, became a journalist. So he was somebody who I think felt a strong degree of gratitude for the opportunities that he'd been given, but also a very strong desire to recognise and celebrate the Kurdish culture that he'd grown up into. Beirouz was an editor of a Kurdish magazine called Weria, which he was very proud of that work, but that work got him into trouble too with the Iranian authorities and he was actually detained and interrogated. <laughs> the Kurdish people always, they are um, under watch and under pressure. You are not able to publish what you want. During that interrogation, he signed a declaration that he would no longer write about Kurdish autonomy, but he continued to do it anyway. He kept contributing to Weria, and his colleagues were arrested. He wrote about that arrest, and that news got out, and that's when he feared for his life. The officers got raided by the Iranian secret police, and his friends were going, you've got to run, mate, you've got to run, so he ran. He left by plane and then he travelled through Southeast Asia, getting to Indonesia. A smuggler said, I can get you to Australia, and he knew that Australia was this liberal democracy where he thought he could be free to write the things that he wanted to write. I paid $5,000 to the smuggler. Then he had two boat trips to get here. First journey was really perilous. The boat sank, he almost drowned. For a second, I opened my eyes. I was under the ocean. It was really dangerous. A fish boat reached to us and helped us and took us from the water. The second boat journey, unfortunately, our boat got lost. So we were lost on the ocean for a week. And he made it to Christmas Island four days after it was announced by the then Prime Minister that no further boat arrivals were going to ever be permitted on Australian soil. From this point forward, asylum seekers who arrive in Australia by boat will be sent to Papua New Guinea for processing and resettlement. The rules have changed. If you come by boat, you will never permanently live in Australia. The bottom line is that we have to protect lives by dealing robustly with people smugglers. Australians have had enough of seeing asylum seekers dying in the waters to our north and our northwest. I also have a message for the people smugglers of our region and the world. Your business model is over. And so Peru's almost immediately was sent to Manus, and there began an imprisonment um, which still continues uh, over five years later. Manus Island is north of the main part of Papua New Guinea. It's almost on the equator. Most of the people held on Manus are young men. For the first few years that they were held on Manus, they were held in locked detention. So Baruz ends up in detention from 2013. He's in the old detention centre for four years. We entered the old detention centre. There were some hangars from World War II where refugees were held. They were still standing. So 130 people were living in this small place. And it was extremely hot. The first six months, they 
didn't give us enough food, water, some basic things. And they forced us to stay in the line for hours just to get some food, a little food. This is one of the Oscars that normally 30 or 40 people are sleeping in. Baruz finds himself at the end of the world. He also finds Reza Barati, who had grown up not too far from him in Iran. He shared an Iranian Kurdish background and they were people whose connection was bolstered by the fact that they were so far from home. He was the most stronger person on Manus Island, but his heart still was a, like a very kind boy. And he was so supportive of everyone, not only the Kurdish men, but also everyone, and they called him Gentle Giant. You have been brought to this place here because you have sought to illegally enter Australia by boat. The new Australian government will not be putting up with those sorts of arrivals. When uh, Scott Morrison uh, came to Manus Island, he said that you will never have this chance to come to Australia and you must go back to your countries or stay here forever. If you have a valid claim, you will not be resettled in Australia. You will never live in Australia. If you choose not to go home, then you will spend a very, very long time here. When you're given a message saying that there is no hope for you, now or forever, this is obviously going to leave people with their backs against the wall. Tonight. This is a very unfortunate incident. This is a very tragic incident. Death in detention as asylum seekers riot on Manus Island. <laughs> The dead detainee received a blow to the head, but the minister can't say who delivered it. Razor Barati is murdered. I mean, that sent a shockwave through the whole prison population. You can lose your life here. After the riots, people uh, were silent <laughs> completely. It was the first time that someone on Manus Island died. Uh, it was completely a uh, uh, tragedy. He was impassioned and he wished to communicate his anger and his hurt to the broadest possible community. Sometimes... Uh, so he began using what he did have, which was a journalistic background and some basic communications technology, to start getting information and to start sending that information to journalists and activists in Australia... When I establish my network... ..who might be able to get the word out. I've been coordinating a group called Writing Through Fences, which supports writers and artists in immigration detention. I got a message from a man on Manus who said there's a journalist on Manus, you should be in contact with him. Beruz was using the internet room one morning, once a week. His English was quite rudimentary at the time, so it was a difficult start, but he was writing short stories about what was happening in they were very affecting and very strong, and I was amazed when I first started reading his work. It wasn't really until 2015 that we got people to start publishing his work. He wrote memorials for his friends who had died. He referred to living like under a sledgehammer.
and I think that writing saved him from some of the worst um, of the mental health conditions that he was surrounded by. But then one day he told me he'd written this story, which he called The Man Who Loves Ducks. And it was this beautiful story of this man Beirut had uh, met. Even the guards loved this man. Everyone knew him as the man who loves ducks. And he just found this humanity in this man and, and he wrote about how being with him made Beirut feel like the weight of the world was off his shoulders. Over the years, a small group of people have gathered around Behrouz and become quite like a family. None of us actually knew each other prior to this. Janet contacted me and said, look, here is a writer who is in exile and imprisoned. Can you come on board and can we get an international campaign going? He is an important thinker for Australia. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. because he, he brings an amazing perspective. Yeah. The Behrouz Pashani that I've come to know is a man that is driven, has a sense of purpose and mission, very intense. From early on, we were pushing the Australian media and the literary community to actually look at his work. We needed to take that seriously. And then Geordie Williamson had read some of Beres' work and said that he was interested in looking at it. No one had actually broken through the carapace of silence that had grown up around the offshore solution. And I sent him a message saying, I am a publisher and I would love if you could write a book. <laughs> This whole book was written in secret, in Farsi language, using WhatsApp and basically staying out of sight from all the authorities. This book I wrote it in the phone and sent it uh, text by text out. And uh, because the reason was, you know, I didn't feel safe to write it on a paper. He had a phone smuggled in, a very rudimentary mobile phone. We would be speaking and then suddenly it would go and he would have had to hide it. When I received every chapter, basically what I was looking at was one long text message. So essentially the, the translation process was also an editing process. It was a ludicrous undertaking. How do we do this? How do we even pay the advance due to Beru's when he has no uh, bank account and has no standing as an Australian citizen? What I would get from Omid is material that came in jags. We'd suddenly get 15,000 words that would deal with, say, the near drowning of Christmas Island, and then you'd have silence. have word that Beru's had health issues. Psychologically, he was not in a good place. I got to the point where I thought, well, this book is unlikely to actually take place. And suddenly, there would be a, a rush of new material. <laughs> when we look at the way in which he communicated on this mobile phone, it's also part of how we made the film, Chalka, Please Tell Us the Time with the Dutch-based um, Iranian filmmaker, and they were doing it through WhatsApp. Hundreds of images being transmitted across the oceans. I had to do it in a way that the detainees don't know I am making a movie. I had to stay awake and do it at morning, four o'clock, five o'clock, the internet was much better because the internet was very slow. This is a film about tedium. It's about wasted hours, wasted days, wasted months, 
wasted years being in limbo. The next question is a video from Beirut's Buhani uh, on Manus Island, Papua New Guinea. Beirut's words have really turned the world's attention to Australia and Australia's policies. I'm talking to you from Manus Prison. Australia exiled me here by force three years ago. What is my crime? I am a refugee who fled injustice, discrimination and persecution. I didn't leave my family by choice. Why am I still in this illegal prison after three years? I don't know anything about his personal circumstances. I, I can tell you just a few things. He's had a preliminary assessment from PNG Immigration Department saying he does meet the criteria to be recognised as a refugee. Malcolm Turnbull had to respond to Behruz's questions. I mean, they were really important questions that I think aren't asked uh, often enough. A person who has been found to be uh, given refugee status in PNG uh, is able to then uh, seek, a, is able then to settle in PNG. Uh, they, I know, I'm sure that he's, he, he would rather come to Australia, but that option is not available to him. Australia's Manus Island Detention Centre will be shut down. Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister made the announcement after his country's Supreme Court ruled it illegal. Beru's did not wish to leave the detention centre. And this sounds bizarre, having fought so hard for his freedom. But the fact was, he feared more for his safety and those around him outside of the centre than within it. I hope we get results. I hope we get a result soon. He's seeking a Supreme Court injunction to keep the centre open on behalf of the 600 men still inside. Long time, why? Four, half years. We discovered through Senate estimates that the intention of the Immigration Department was that they would cut off the electricity, the drinking water, the food and all medical support at midnight on October the 31st. One day we woke up and see nobody was there. <laughs> Everyone left there. So we found ourselves without protection, without food, without water, nothing. There was a lot of cockroaches moving around everywhere. As you see, this stuff is also not working. Determined and armed, police moved in. After resisting for weeks, all inmates were forced out. Buses took them to alternative accommodation sites. Beirut was arrested and jailed twice. The second time was during the evacuation of the Manus Island camp. And they arrested him, they roughed him up, and they told him that he had damaged the reputation of Manus Island. They actually told him that he had to stop his reporting. And we were relocated to new compounds, this place that we are living right now. Here is the uh, Islorongo camp, so I'm living here. He operates under curfew. His freedom of movement is curtailed. He's not a free man. We are allowed to go outside at morning until evening. A number of supporters visited Behruz after he was allowed out of the detention centre after the 2016 ruling. I saw Behruz on television. My father was a Kurdish man too, and Kurdish people are quite famous for their strong resistance. I knew straight away that I'm going to go to Manus Island. I had this idea that I want to do two bodies of work when I'm there. One was a photographic series. And the other one was a video work. We created this in response to the death of Reza Barati and the pain that is still they endure from, from that loss. 
and the brotherhood that they shared and the desire to want to protect that person that is gone and the desire to turn the time back. We were very concerned about the reception and the publication of Beruz's book. But the reception really actually took us by surprise. There was only a huge outpouring of goodwill. It's a beautiful book. It really is very literary. So today is... What's the date today? 22, I think. It's an angry book and its anger is what gives it its impetus and its energy. And I think that it's the kind of book which joins a long library of prison memoirs. Well, he made us see what we wished we never had to see. Oh, my friend, good. And he did it with a great integrity and honesty. When you read the book, the refugees aren't angels at all. I wrote this for you, I promise you. Some of them are brutal, some of them are selfish. That's the power of what he did. Maybe I sign it for you. He didn't seek to glorify them or sanctify them. He presented them as human beings. And then we started to get to the end of year best books list, and it was everywhere. <laughs> So we were at the award ceremony and it was a very emotional time for all of us. We knew the significance of the occasion. Those involved with the prize made a waiver so that Beruz could be considered as an Australian writer. The winner of the Victoria Prize for Literature is No Friend But The Mountains, writing from Manus Prison by Beruz Ocioni. And when they announced that his book had won, I just found myself weeping. I was just in tears because, and screaming, because it just felt like, my God, I can't believe at last. I can believe it. Like, from the first moment I read his work, I knew that this writer was going to be big in the world. But for this to actually happen was huge. I was looking around, looking at Arnold's face, Omid's face, Janet's face, and his other friends who were there. And we were all in tears. I was thinking about, like, that journey up until here. Who would have thought that this can be possible? To me, it was a historical moment. I thought the most appropriate way to represent Behrouz was to come on stage while communicating with him via WhatsApp at the same time. Uh. I think it's important for everyone who has been following Behrouz's work to understand that after the interviews are finished, Behrouz switches off his phone and goes back to his isolated, remote incarceration. When I said goodbye to him, I had to go and watch him walk through the gates, watch him inform the guards of his number, watch them document his entry. What rights does he have? What future does he have? It would be very difficult for him to leave Papua New Guinea and go anywhere else. Be very difficult for him to establish a worthwhile life in Papua New Guinea and it looks as though it will be very difficult for him to get to Australia so his options are not good. I hope Beru's remains strong. My parents actually it's hard for them to imagine my condition. It's hard to explain this situation for them. My mother always told tell me that bearers, please don't write against their government. <laughs> but I think for me, I always believe in writing. So I will continue. <laughs>